Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works. Scott's going to teach us what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. And today we have Scott Margolius. He's founder of FeedbackRepair.com. If you didn't catch that in the opening statements, he helps people with feedback repair and he helps protect Amazon eBay, eBay sellers from bad reviews and make sure they don't get removed. He helps clean up nightmare situations of sellers' accounts or products getting banned. Uh, he spent 15 years as COO at Fimco, which is a marketing and customer service company. He is a top-rated eBay power seller and has been among the top 25 sellers in Amazon for the holiday season. And Sorry, we'll f- top, Go ahead. Top, top, uh, top 25%. Top 25% sellers in Amazon for holiday season. Top 25 sellers would be cool too. And uh, yeah. he'll tell us how you get there. And even it's still impressive. You were talking about what volume and capacity is involved in that. That was pretty remarkable when you're talking about that. But we'll get to that. So first of all, Scott, thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, for uh, fixing the setup. We'll, we'll talk about what's behind you in the dark there, some of the e-commerce uh, secret sauce behind you. Um, but first, you know, we are talking about some of the most common problems causing bad feedback. So that's people claiming it's counterfeit, sold, you know, sold as used, and people are claiming it's new. What are the other top problems causing bad feedback? Well, you know, there's obviously a, there's a big difference between negative feedback and having your account be brought on to review and to review yeah. uh, when when it's like in jeopardy of suspension. And I think that they're very much related. I see yeah. a lot of cases where someone has been suspended that have their account privileges revoked, uh, at least temporarily, because of the fact that it was brought to Amazon's attention that there was a negative feedback. They're looking at this negative feedback you know, automatically, yeah. and they're looking at certain keywords that come up, and in many cases if there is a claim of counterfeit or if there's a claim of uh, used sold as new and then there's other ones in addition to that that can flag accounts Mm -hmm. but uh, one of them I mean a lot of the time you'll see something very simple straightforward in that uh, they didn't receive the product you know never received it or they or it was damaged or uh, another really big one is not as described so those are all kinds of things that are that are pretty frequent in uh, common occurrence, mm-hmm. uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, there there are obviously quite a few others. I mean, it has a lot to do with what that buyer's expectations were. Mm-hmm. You know, if they assumed that the product was going to be something different than what they ended up receiving, somehow or another, you're still responsible for that. So, a lot of those types of issues can be resolved if you sell via fulfillment by Amazon instead of merchant fulfilled. Yeah, but that's still not bulletproof. It's just better in terms of protecting your account. Right. Because then you could say, well, Amazon didn't deliver to you. It wasn't me type of thing. Right. And then you're automatically protected and there's a bias on Amazon's part to protect your account in that situation. Right. So that's, that, that happened, since that happens so often and you don't have any control as a seller over whether or not something got delivered, you, all you can do is make sure you ship the exact product that was listed, make sure your product is in new condition, make sure you packed it well, and make sure you you know, shipped it in a reasonable time frame so that it re- is received by the EDD, the estimated delivery date. And that's about as much as you can do if you're merchant fulfilled. But it everything changes if something happens in the process of between the time it left your doorstep or the, between the time it left Amazon's uh, shipping center and the time the customer receives it. And even after that, a lot of the time what happens is customer will receive a product and be unhappy with it for whatever reason, or they want it for free, so they make certain claims because those specific claims are the only ones that can be made in order for them to be able to get the product for free, get a free refund, Mm -hmm. and not have to pay return shipping. Mm. So there's a higher likelihood of those types of claims because those are the ones that buyers know they can use in order to be able to cheat the system. 
Yeah. And obviously, like you were saying, the negative feedback can then trigger, end up triggering your account to get reviewed and then obviously banned in the, in the end. What are other uh, things that you see that cause people to get negative feedback? Maybe if uh, the product is damaged mm -hmm. when they receive it. Maybe if the product uh, packaging isn't the same. Maybe if uh, the customer just doesn't understand the feedback system. I see that happen all the time. They'll leave three stars and say, okay. Or they'll leave three stars and say, thanks. Amazon re uh, views a three-star feedback instead of neutral, like you would assume, and it's called neutral. It actually counts against you in your metrics. Really? So. That that happens fairly frequently. Hmm. So, um, oh, and the other the other thing that happens, probably as much as anything, uh, you know, statistically, is they didn't receive it in the time frame they expected. And, you know, uh, on the con contrary side of that, the majority of my positive feedback comes from customers who receive the product sooner than they expected. Hmm. So, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So how did you discover that three stars works against you? And what can people do about it? Because I would think uh, it's neutral. I you know, I don't remember. I mean, it's it seems fairly intuitive once you figure it out. I mean, you can look at all your metrics and they show you the statistics yeah. and, and determine, hey, why are these three stars counting against me? And I think it was at that point when I first realized this doesn't make sense. Why are they calling these neutral, but they actually count against me? Yeah. Um, I assume that it's probably stated somewhere, but most people would know that. So what should people do? You should try to have them removed. You know, there's a mechanism for that. When you go into Seller Central and you go to uh, help and then you click on, let me see if I can pull it up real quickly and I'll walk you through it. If you go to... How much of this are you going to edit out? I've got a lot of I don't. Change. I don't edit anything out. Oh, for real? <laughs> yeah. <That's... laughs> All right, so if you go to contact us, yeah, and then you choose uh, performance. Mm -hmm. No, you don't choose performance. You go to selling on Amazon. They're, the funny thing is they're changing this all the time. I used yeah. to, to walk people through it really straightforward and not miss a beat, but they, they change it all the time, and different types of accounts have different types of interfaces. Mm. So it's really interesting. There are at least three or m possibly more interfaces that people see. So um, we'll, we'll make a disclaimer of at this moment in time, this, yeah, is, what it, this really, is what it says. Yeah. And it changed, and it changed uh, since two weeks ago as well. Is there a uh, search I mean, function people should, should use, like get feedback removed or something like that that may – be more standard this is the easiest way you can either go to contact us mm -hmm. upon which page you're on um or you can go to help and then go to contact us Let's see if i can do that sorry i'm having to look at my screen beyond my other screen i've got three screens up um and then you go to selling on amazon and then you go to customers and orders and then you can put in the order id of the feedback that you want to have removed mm-hmm um, from there, I can't tell you what happens because I don't have any negative feedback. So I can't. <laughs> of course you correct. don't. <laughs> but then typically it'll ask, do you want to have this removed? And then it will either remove it for you automatically because it meets their criteria or you will have a response and you'll have an opportunity to choose from either four or five different things. And mm -hmm. it just depends if you're an FBA seller. Most of the time, you would choose this. This is an FBA issue, and it should therefore be removed for that purpose. But there are some instances where there will be something else going on that the reason why they would remove it has nothing to do with FBA, even though you're an FBA seller. Mm -hmm. So that's when you have to have kind of a bag of tricks yeah. that that help you get things fixed. So Scott, do you get most phone calls? and emails from people who are in dire straits, or do you get more just people, I need to remove these 10 negative feedback? When do people come to you? I'd say most of them come from people trying to make their account situation better. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't get too many, you know, maybe a, a few a month, I'd say, 
of people who are in dire straits. Yeah. What thing, what I have realized more often than not usually these days, <laughs> if that's a whole lot of caveats in a row, that um, some of the feedback that people have that they aren't getting removed or aren't concerned about or aren't doing anything about puts their account in a lot more jeopardy than they realized. The, yeah. the, those those issues need to be attacked proactively and aggressively as quickly as possible. You yeah. can't just let them sit there because of the fact that it really can affect your the health of your account. Yeah. You know, a claim like that and you're like, oh, that's ridiculous. Let's say you get all upset. I cannot believe they're saying this is counterfeit. I'm so tired of these, you know, thieves or whatever. you got to attack it immediately. Right. You can't let it sit there. And there are a number of different things that you can do beyond that. I mean, for instance, you, you never let a performance notification go unanswered. You have to look at every single one. I had one customer who had 80 performance notifications that they had never even looked at. I couldn't believe they still had an active account. Uh, part of the problem is you can't tell th their system for showing you the performance notifications and tracking them and responding and seeing what responses are is really, really poorly done. Right. Like it's almost an afterthought. There's not a real system or ticketing method or anything like that that allows you to see what you did or didn't respond to or what you said, any of those kinds of things. Essentially, a lot of the time, what I'm encouraging people to do is take a performance notification and instead of just looking at it, actually respond even if they don't want you to or even if they're not requesting you to and open a case so that you can get a specific response mm -hmm. and get it on record that, hey, I did something about this, more than just clicking all the way through to the special note that they wanted you to read and help. Right. It, it, especially claims of counterfeit or uh, use sold as new, those kinds of things, I think it's very important for people to take action on in order to protect their accounts. Yeah. So, Scott, believe, yeah. go ahead. Um, uh, I was going to say, I can't believe you didn't tell me this wasn't going to be edited. <laughs> this is just a natural conversation, you know, whatever whatever we, we talk uh, about. You know what, if I was or something. Well, <laughs> you can do that, too. Um, <laughs> so, what's the biggest nightmare that you've seen that you had to clean up? I mean, I've seen a number of them. I, I've seen one customer who had a buyer claim that their uh, product was counterfeit. They had purchased $50,000 worth of that one ASIN, which is pretty deep to buy into a particular ASIN. I mean, they had Gaylords of this stuff sitting around. Yeah. And, you know, some of the best practices for responding to something like that, let's say you just have three that you picked up and, you you know, you bought your product via retail arbitrage or something like that. It's not a big loss to have a claim like that right. and to, for defense to be, I'm going to delete this ASIN out of my catalog, which, by the way, everybody should do. If you have ASINs in your catalog that you're not currently selling that you'd have no stock on, you should go in and proactively delete those ASINs out of your catalog. A lot of the time what that means is you archive it first and then go in and delete it. Mm -hmm. But you see a lot of notifications come through where they are saying, hey, you know, you are not authorized to sell this anymore. Or mm. you, you see issues where you have these kind of vestigial ASINs still in your catalog that you didn't do anything with, you didn't think anything about because you no longer have stock on that. And that doesn't mean that you're protected just because you don't yeah. have stock. You just need to so clean it out. You got to clean it out. So one of the things you go in and proactively do is, um, you know, I'm taking care of this and I'm being very uh, aggressive by uh, going be above and beyond, and r I remove this ASIN from my catalog. Well, in this case, you're going to put fifty thousand dollars at jeopardy by saying I accept full responsibility. I'm sorry, I removed the ASIN. And you know, a lot of the time, uh, for me anyway, the majority of the things that I've purchased for resale are specifically for the Amazon platform. Like I wouldn't have purchased them to sell anywhere else. I'm not gonna mm. sell my garage sale. These same things aren't gonna sell nearly as well on eBay. You're hosed if you don't have some sort of other outlet. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't that doesn't apply as well, let's say if you're let's say if you're a Scubana customer and you've got multiple marketplaces where you purchase something with the uh, eye in mind that hey maybe you can sell it on Rakuten or Sears or eBay or whatever maybe you're a little bit better insulated from that kind of issue. Yeah. 
in this case, we approached it very aggressively. We asserted, you know, the um, the authenticity of of the product. We proved the provenance of the product. We provided all the invoices and said this buyer is incorrect. They don't know what they're talking about. We've been selling this exact type of product in this industry for X number of years. We're the authority on this subject. You can look it up on Wikipedia. And we said we need to be reinstated to be able to sell this product, and this customer is wrong. Yeah. And we got that. We were able to be reinstated. So, for I mean, that's an example of a uh, ASIN-specific uh, notification of, you know, uh, suspension. Right. Right. So what's another um, nightmare situation? I know you have a number of them. What's another one? Well, I'll tell you this this deal I was working on the last few days with a 25-day suspension mm-hmm. for something that he's no way responsible for. I just, I mean, if that doesn't give you pause and, and cause you to think, I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket. Uh, I had another customer who was suspended for at least 15, but maybe 19 days. I can't remember what it ended up being in total. You know, he's losing between eleven and fifteen thousand dollars a day. Wow. You've got to be diversified. I, that's one of again, one of the advantages of being in a uh, marketplace having a marketplace product that allows you to get your product into multiple different, you know, selling venues to so have more more eyeballs on it than just Amazon. Yeah. So what did that person do? They were losing eleven thousand dollars a day. How why'd they get banned and what'd they do? They were banned for um, some of the products that they were selling were a like a three pack with three different specific things, mm-hmm. and in some cases maybe one of the three things was missing, or maybe one of the three things was a different color than what the buyer was expecting. Um, and I think that they had they had about seven different things that sh- showed up as issues, all sort of seemed to compound together. In their case, they got rid of three ASINs completely out of their catalog and said, you know, we're never going to sell these again. And a couple of others, they said, these are, you know, genuine. We're not selling anything that's counterfeit. We, we're the direct manufacturer importer, um, but we're not going to continue to sell this product uh, or we're going to have it improved or, or whatever. I can't remember the specific argument. Um, essentially, they they took responsibility for it, but said we're going to improve the process for this. We're going to make you know put more eyes on quality control. Um, we're only going to sell this product via FBA. Those kinds of things. So were they shipping it out on their own, or were they doing FBA in the in those circumstances? At that time, they're in the process of transition. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they had some products that were FBA and some products that were uh, merchant fulfilled, and I can't remember the details, yeah. but it's certainly. That's definitely a nightmare scenario, right? Where mm-hmm. you're down for fifteen or nineteen days, losing eleven to fifteen thousand dollars a day, it's just unbelievably scary. I'll tell you another thing that I've seen several times is, yeah. uh, unfortunately, um, competitors coming in and just sort of ruining things for for people by being particularly shady in their dealings. And so I've seen that happen most often in certain categories, like uh, something around uh, cell phones or cell phone cases, Mm -hmm. uh, specifically in nutraceuticals along those lines, Um, you know, private label brands of of vitamins, let's say. I had uh, one customer I worked with who had a goal of having at least 50 different private label offerings in the, like, let's call it the vitamin space. Sure. Right? His specific intention was to have this many ASINs and for none of them to be on the first page. So he didn't want to be found on the first page. And his reason for that is he had noticed that when he had been on the first page, he drew a lot more attention from competitors. So he wanted to be able to fly under the radar consistently without having to draw attention from people who are going to try to hurt his account. Mm-hmm. He would rather have, you know, 20 sales a day consistently on 50 ASINs than to have 100 sales a day and risk losing his entire account or risk being banned from a certain ASIN. So what are some of the shady, pr- what do people do? I really don't know 
exactly what they do or how they do it. I mean, do they uh, put like negative? I mean, I'm just thinking, do they go on and put false negative feedback? I mean, what do they do to ruin people? That's one of the things they'll do is they'll they'll have false feedback. You know, um, they'll hire a shield buyer, let's say. I mean, I can think of a number of different ways that somebody could do something like that. I hate to even talk about it. I'm just thinking, because, like, if someone's out you know, there and they're, what's that? I wouldn't even want somebody to have these ideas. It's like, let's talk about how to pick a bomb. Right. You know? I'm just, I'm just curious, like, if someone, like, an honest seller is not even thinking that someone's going to come in and do these things, and and something happens to their account, and maybe their sales drop, maybe they'll realize, maybe this is why, maybe not, but they may, it may open their eyes. Like, for me, maybe I'm just too naive, and I like, think the good in people, and I'd be like, oh, sales just dropped. And maybe right. it's something else that, oh, a couple of negative feedback came in, and hmm, that's weird, and not thinking anything of it. Um, and I don't even know how you can really counteract that, uh, per se, but there, I think there's some things. I think it's more important to talk about the kinds of things you could do to counteract it. Yeah, go right? ahead. It's it's such a it's such a difficult situation when you have the mindset of being the best you can be and everybody's playing fair and it's a level playing field. That doesn't exist, right? Unfortunately, but if you always think that way and never think about the fact that you have enemies, then you're going to get taken out. You've got to you've got to have some sort of method of defense mm-hmm. other than just being better than everybody else. Right. Unfortunately, I mean that's just kind of the name of the game. I mean it's offense and defense at the same time. And so it's interesting, you know. I like I'll play basketball uh, several times a week, and nobody likes the guy who only plays offense, even if he scores all the points for the game. And he's like, wow, he's just they hate that the person. Three. They don't like that person. Yeah. He's self. He's a ball hog. All these kinds of things, and you get the same kind of thing if all you ever do is play defense. You know, if I, I, I play they like you more. Well. They like you more, but, but yes. they like you more. Yes. But they still get mad at me if I have an open shot and don't take it. Right, right, right. I mean, I, I certainly have a certain. I have a specific role that I usually play. Yeah. Um, and and I can be relied upon to have great defense even if my offense isn't that great and that that works really well most of the time yeah. but if you have an open shot and don't take it or if you have a layup and miss it oh boy you know people get upset <laughs> justifiably so but i think you i think you have to be well-rounded all the way around just like that's what you need in your game plan for for selling products especially if you're a private label seller yeah so then how do we counteract those things like you said we don't want to you know, give people the ingredients to build a bomb, even though I'm, I'm tempted to, to do that. Um, what are some things they should do to counteract what people can be doing to their account when they maybe see them on page one? Um, when you see what on page one? You know, like, uh, let's say a competitor sees you on page one. What are some things nice. to do okay. to counteract? You know, at some point, you have a little bit of built-in protection, right? I mean, you can be so big that uh, you're pretty safe. Maybe they'll go after everybody else. Maybe maybe the the guy who's the uh, person with ill intent just sort of writes off the person who has 1,300, you know, four and a half star feedback. And they're like, I'm never going to compete with that guy, but all these other guys, I'm going to try to take them out. Mm-hmm. Um, so he would buy their product and leave negative feedback at, about it, uh, which would not be negative feedback, but it'd be a... a by a uh, review, product review, mm-hmm. and say you know all kinds of horrible things about that product, or you know why it's not as good as something else, or why all the other reviews are very suspect, and you know you should pay attention to this and r- try to write something compelling in some cases that would lead other potential customers to think, hmm, I should question right. why all this feedback is so positive. Um, but another thing you'll see is they will just shoot through sheer numbers, try to build the negatives, mm-hmm. right? Um, and in cases like that, where you have negatives that are being built up and they're not verified reviews, I think that Amazon's putting some systems in place to try to uh, deflate that methodology. And I've actually worked with some um, private label sellers to have those types of reviews removed. Uh, and I've been successful with that uh, several times. 
it's not the same as having uh, negative feedback removed. If you ask me to have your negative feedback removed, I can tell you without even re re seeing your account or knowing the nature of what those negatives are, I'm going to help you. I'm going right. to be able to get that fixed, and I'm going to be able to help your metrics. And I've always been able to help people with that. But when it comes to uh, getting negative reviews removed, it's almost more of a we're gonna. It's a best effort. Right. You know, there's some certain things that you can do that that are helpful. And I mean, everything I'm doing is white hat. I'm not doing anything that's gray hat or black hat. So I can tell you that there's some ways you could do that, but I don't do it. Right. Um, so. There's you know, no, no true way to insulate yourself besides just being proactive and if something comes on your account, going after it if it's, you know, because it's not true or something like that. That's kind of the best you can do. I mean, yeah. I mean I, I'm sure that if you sat around and looked at specific situations, you could come up with strategies to counteract those types of issues. And, and mm. I like doing that. I, I mean, I don't like people seeing people be in that situation, but I like coming up with those kinds of solutions. And... An, you know, a number of things that I've developed to help people with their accounts with that kind of insulation is not only do I recommend that everybody be FBA as much as possible, yeah. but I also recommend that they uh, include inserts with their products. Yeah, tell that, me about that. Yeah. Well, uh, you're essentially trying to get this customer to come to you directly instead of go to Amazon. So even if they're a thief, you still want them to come to you instead of Amazon. Even if they're uh, unhappy for any reason, you still want them to come to you instead of Amazon. And, you know, a number of people have some uh, misgivings about that. You know, there's a little bit of debate. It's like, well, isn't that the purpose of FBA? It's like, well, yes, that's true. But if you truly want to protect your account, you'll siphon as many of those complaints and concerns away from mm -hmm. Amazon's customer service as possible so that you get to handle them directly. Just have them email you on your website. They don't have to post it and it doesn't become negative on your Amazon account, but you can still handle it. You want to handle it before it ever gets to that point. Yeah. And uh, you have to be very careful with that. You don't want to violate the terms of service uh, when, when you create those inserts. And it's a, it's a balancing act to make sure that you don't overstep the line. The number one thing that you've got to remember is that Amazon considers all these customers to be theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, if your merchant fulfilled, they expect you to provide just as good or if not better of a uh, customer experience as they do but at the end of the day they still consider all these customers to be theirs and they hold you responsible if there's a right. fault right. of any kind and if it looks in any way shape or form like you're trying to siphon these customers away to your own website uh, to be able to make future sales directly then that could be a real issue so one of the things that we've done before when we're trying to be you know ultra conservative is We've taken the draft, all the draft language of a particular insert, and we sent it off to seller performance uh, or, or somebody you know in, mm. in help, seller support, to approve it. the exact yeah. language and basically give a stamp of approval. So mm. at least you have something in the record as a case that you can point to to say, hey, you know, mm. if let's let's pretend that a competitor bought our product, you know, with bad intentions, and then they saw this insert, and let's say they turned it in, turned us in. We wouldn't ever want yeah. something like that to be able to be used against us. So you got to be clean all the way around. But it's an excellent practice for everybody to engage in. Yeah. So what's the balance there, Scott? Because on one hand, FBA, people should be doing FBA. On the other hand, obviously, diversifying in these inserts, you're going to have to fulfill on your own, right? No, you can't include them with your FBA product. Oh, how do you do especially that? Especially yeah. if you're private label. Especially if you're private label. Because then you can design the whole box. You can put whatever you want inside the box, all that kind of thing. I mean, it's a little bit more challenging. You got to be a little bit more creative if you're doing retail arbitrage, or even you know wholesale from a vendor, or direct from a manufacturer, to try to get your insert into that package yeah. when you're shipping it off. That, yeah. That's a little more challenging, but I think it, I mean, in a lot of cases, it can still be done. Yeah, you'd have kids. It can, it can definitely be done with bundles. You can do that with bundles all day long because you're creating the bundle. Yeah, you'd have to be have your hands on it first, and then put it, and then send it off to FBA, as opposed to someone who has it manufactured and then sent directly to Amazon, right? Yes and no. Yeah. I mean, not necessarily. You might be able to have the relationship with the manufacturer that they would do that for you. Mm -hmm. More often than not, if you don't want to handle it, then you'd send it to a 3PL, you know, or some sort of a fulfillment center, uh, packing, packing and shipping and kitting and all those kinds of things, and mm -hmm. that'd just be one more. Thing. 
they do while they're labeling it for you. Yeah. If it's not being shipped directly from the wholesaler or the manufacturer to to FBA. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Because that is, you know, what can you do to diversify? What other things do you recommend people doing? Because that's a huge theme I see you talking about. Because one of the people get stuck if all their stuff is on Amazon and they get banned, they're pretty much you know, up the creek. So what should they do to diversify more? So inserts I mean, the, is one. The answer, well, inserts isn't really, doesn't necessarily count as diversification. Um, I know one uh, seller who's uh, an Inc. 500 business, right? He does the majority of his sales on his own website, mm -hmm. and he uses Amazon as basically marketing to get people to his website because as of right now until I think the end of uh, October, I can't remember the exact deadline, that you still can have the Amazon product ads where you can get people's uh, attention on the buy page to siphon them off to come to your site. So he, he's using that methodology right now to grow. The, the, basically, the biggest referrer for his own website is Amazon mm -hmm. using those ads. So you're, uh, they're then, getting rid of those. They're they're phasing they're phasing it out. So they say as it's as it is. Mm -hmm. Now there are a lot of changes like that that they say are going to take place that never do. So I'd say you know, gosh, if you're using that, make the most of it. And ultimately, it doesn't sound like to me they're they're completely getting rid of it. It sounds like it's just going to be changed to look a little bit more like the text ads on Google. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of having images. So even then, it still might be an effective, you know, thing to pursue. It certainly will be worth looking into. He also runs ads on, you know, various different platforms beyond just Google. You know, if you're looking at some of the other search engines, which I think get overlooked quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it depends on your industry. It depends. Let's, you know, your particular website, maybe Instagram has the best opportunities for you. Maybe it's Pinterest. Maybe it's Twitter. Maybe it's Facebook. There are just uh, so many other things beyond just AdWords, and some of those other platforms are a lot less expensive, mm -hmm. a, lot less, a lot less competition. So what other ad platforms? You mentioned AdWords, and then what was the one, what would someone look up to do that for Amazon? You said there's a specific one on Amazon. What is that called? Uh, well, that's Amazon product ads offered by them oh. themselves, and they have a number of different uh, you know, advertising functions. Mm -hmm. I... I haven't, I've only used one of them, I think, and I can't remember exactly which one it was. It's been a while. Yeah. Uh, there's, there are, you know, whole devotees of some of the different strategies and tactics that you can get from having used that because it, in some ways it looks a lot like a AdWords account in that you can deploy a specific campaign and from having done so, you can gather all these keywords that Amazon thinks are the best keywords for your particular product and then you can take what you've learned from there that was more of a shotgun approach and develop your own targeted, you know, uh, sniper approach to get traffic to your particular product or to your website. Yeah. And there are two different, I'm talking basically about two different products within Amazon, but they're both very effective, uh, very useful. Yeah. Scott, so on that subject for you or your clients, what else do you see that's working for diversification? Because I do see people just depending almost solely I, on Amazon. I, I think it's 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 basically a number of different answers to that, right? In terms of your business model, in terms of you know where you are from an entrepreneurial perspective. I think everybody, or for the most part, people should be looking at having a diversified portfolio on Amazon. Mm -hmm. in, in in other words, across multiple categories across gated categories using multiple different techniques. I mean, they should look at their their inventory as almost being a mutual fund, right? So you wouldn't want to be all wholesale. You, you, you wouldn't want to be all private label necessarily. I mean, people are killing it in every single one of these ways, but what happens when something happens? Right. And so... And, and, and you avoid so many different issues like uh, the cyclical nature of sales of a certain type. Let's pretend you're selling only barbecue gloves. Okay, they probably only sell really well at certain times of the year, right? Right, or certain parts so, of the country, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you, you want to, there's so many different reasons to be diversified there in terms of 
you know, let's say you have several private label products and your goal is to get out one new one per X, you know, per month or per every two months or whatever. Let's say you get into selling books and maybe you have a particular number of niches within books that you're focused on. Let's, uh, you can do retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, you can do wholesale, uh, closeouts, all these different things. You can create bundles and each one of those certain areas has all of its own tactics and strategies and ways that you could um, gain advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think many different ways that you can gain advantage and make your product offerings uh, distinctive or insulated against uh, competition, that that makes the most sense. No, yeah. Nobody really wants, I mean, lots of people are making a lot of money just selling widgets. Okay, I sell, I sell you know, 20 widgets a day and I've got a uh, thousand items in my catalog and some are selling 20 and some are selling 10 and, you know, that's not nearly as exciting as having some true um, depth on your bench of, yeah. of the product that you're selling. Yeah. You, you know, you I bought an, an entire pallet of one particular closeout and it sells awesome for me and the margins are outstanding and, and I'm the only one selling it. Uh, another reason why you want to have things like that is because I had another product that was really, it was great. It was, I was buying it for five bucks a piece and it was selling all day long for, uh, $25. Um, it's not the most incredible margins in the world, but it was super reliable and I was selling quite a few of them yeah. sold out. I went to reorder and I found that all of a sudden out of, out of the blue, out of nowhere, there were at least 10 other FBA sellers before when it was just, I, it was just me. Then all of a sudden I had two competitors. I sold out, waited a month, was going to reorder, and I didn't place another order because there were at least 10 other people competing. Really? And they were all in a race to the bottom and driven the price down to the point where I would still make money, but I didn't care anymore. wasn't excited about it. Right. So How does that happen? They just research what's – do they have certain tools that they're using to find this out, or are they just observing certain categories? I don't know. I know what I do. I mean, I, I – <laughs> developed a product research tool that yeah that talk about that a little bit because this uh, is you know a uh, spy tool or research tool whatever you want to call it kind of i mean basically you upload a list and it tells you which of the products on that list are ones that you might want to focus on to sell mm -hmm. it's it's that simple essentially and uh there were three of us who developed that uh there are two of us who are still operating that uh research company now and that's what I use when I have a, a huge list that I want to look up. Mm -hmm. But there are certainly a lot of other ways that people are, you know, functioning to find their their key areas that they want to focus on. There, there are a lot of great tools out right now. I don't. Have you released them, it to the public but, yet, or is it only uh, for you right now? Uh, it, well, it's in beta, but it's fully functional. Anybody can use it. It's mm -hmm. endable. I N D B L dot com. Okay. Um, we've we've actually got somebody who has uh, started using it, and they are educating a num a large number of other sellers. They have a pretty good following, and they're they're telling us, "Hey, this tool is amazing. It's the first tool we've ever used that worked the first time we used it, yeah. and that does everything that we want it to do." And we're excited to push this out to all of our you know students. And so, I mean, that's pretty exciting because. We, we love opportunities like that. So whether and, they use this tool or another tool or research it online, wh how should people best use a tool like this to improve their sales or to find new products? There, there are probably you know ten different ways you can use the tool. Uh, there, are, once once you get your research back and you sort what it is that you're looking at. Um, so let's say you sort it by um, sales rank, and then maybe you. I, I always filter out everything that's a higher rank than the target area where I want to be looking, and I'll I'll take that and I'll put it to another uh, worksheet or work uh, worksheet within the same workbook, and so I didn't lose that data, but it's not my area of focus at the moment because mm -hmm. let's say I have 800 items, and all of a sudden I boil it down to okay here. Are, 10 items that are within the area I want to focus in terms of having an active, decent sales rank on Amazon right. today, then I'll take that and I'll narrow it down further by uh, what's the best margin 
because basically mm. you can we can search by any keyword. So if you choose your column of keywords that you want to search by, whether that's UPC or ISBN or ASIN or uh, you know product description. Uh, obviously, the narrower the information, the better information it is to get returned. So you know the most the narrowest information might be the UPC. So you search by UPC and then you identify the column of your price that you want to search by, and we'll bring back and uh, give you everything else that's coming from the Amazon database in terms of sales rank or uh, FBA margin or MFN margin, all those kinds of things, number of sellers, uh, the feedback of those sellers, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the next thing I would sort by would be, let's say, I really don't want to sell MFN anymore. I, I just don't have time. Um, and I, I mean, I barely have time to sell anything at all. It's, it's uh, interesting. Like if I see a really good deal, I might jump on it. Um, but more often than not, I'm actually doing research as a value added uh, opportunity for some of my customers. You know, right. they'll want new product. I've got one. I've got one customer who has twenty seven thousand SKUs deep. I mean, not just one off, but deep in uh, FBA right now. They want to grow that to a hundred thousand SKUs, hmm. and they're willing to pay me to bring new uh, information to them so they can continue to increase that. So. It's you know it's a unique opportunity because I've got a lot of different things I can research you know a lot of opportunity there to provide this information to him and I'm not taking advantage of it anymore. At one point mm-hmm. I, I amassed all that for myself and as I've moved more and more away from selling and more toward uh, helping other sellers, I don't have as much use for that at yeah. this point. Yeah. So it's, it's got the obvious question which you may not be able to answer is. Um, because it's privy information to your clients, but um, when you first start selling, where do you find good deals? Uh, like the, again, you know, depends, I think, a lot on what you're looking for. Yeah. Are you RA? Are you OA? I mean, for let's say for online arbitrage, people a lot of the time subscribe to lists, right? So mm-hmm. they pay X number of dollars, $25 a month to get 10 deals a week or something like that. You know, there are all kinds of opportunities like that. Uh, I've got a friend and partner who does that just for shoes, right? So there's a lot of margin and opportunity in shoes, so he's focused on shoes and he's become an expert there. And you see that for all kinds of different offers. And so mm-hmm. essentially what's happening is somebody's curating a list of subscribers and they're using more often than not uh, VAs, uh, virtual assistants who are going out and finding these deals mm-hmm. and providing them to the the subscribe uh, to the subscriber curator to be able to push those out to people in their network. Um, so that, you know that works out pretty well often for uh, online arbitrage. But a lot of the time, people will just you know they'll go to every single deals opportunity. So they'll go to I think Brad's deals and they'll go to um, oh gosh all, all all the different deals sites uh, for or coupon sites or Retail Me Not or you know whatever it might be to maximize their spend, you know, they'll go to raise.com and get a discount on the gift card, then they'll use the, their uh, credit card and get their 3% or 5% cash back, right. and by the time they're done, they've got whatever, 25, 30% off or more off of their purchase, and it was already the best deal available, and that's where they get their, uh, the margin. their margin proposition uh, opportunity to be able to sell it at a better price on Right. Amazon make money. So that, I mean, that's all that, like as far as where people finding their deals, that's just for online arbitrage. And there yeah. are, you know, a ton more tips and tricks beyond that just for online arbitrage. And then you yeah. just take that and move that over to every single different type. I mean, there are, people are paying $5,000 a class to learn how to do private label. Right. Uh, what so, does someone have to do? I mean, let's say someone's growing at a larger scale, like your client, I mean, 10 thousand to twenty thousand SKUs or twenty seven thousand to a hundred thousand SKUs, what do they do in that case? You know, there there are a lot of people out there who have basically more money than they have opportunity. They 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 would basically be able to spend as much as they can wherever there's opportunity to take advantage of. So there there are some people it's like, you know, you could hire somebody who all they do is search for you, or you could hire ten people like that and all they do is go out into the field and find retail arbitrage stuff for you. So you see that happening all the time. You know, let's say you're in some major city and you've got 
10 people who go out every weekend. You've hired them, you know, part time or as a, a contract basis. You've given them scanners and you've given them all of your different um, priorities for what you're looking for in a product and teach them how to do what you do. And they go out and buy all this stuff for you. You could do that. Uh, there's there are booksellers who do that and who have expanded to multiple different communities. So they've hired somebody to go out in their city and they're, you know, expanded across the country where they've got people who essentially work for them looking for certain types of books and doing scanning all over the country yeah. looking for books. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, there are so many different ways to grow. And going back to, you know, what you're asking as far as diversification, the, the answer is anything. You know, you could to sock your money away and buy car washes or, you know, storage units or, you know, build your own website and, and develop your own product and sell on there, build, be building a brand there. It just, I think people should do things that they're good at, right? Assess, assess what you're the very best at and what you enjoy doing the most and capitalize on that so that the work that you're doing doesn't feel like work, but is still something where you're able to be successful and gain an advantage. So let me ask you, so on that example, Scott, of the books, right? Let's say someone grows and they have 10,000 SKUs of books, right? And they're the book specialty. And let's say they decide to then, they want to go into barbecue equipment, right? Okay. Do you think that they should sell on the same account or open a different account? And if they do, do they have to notify Amazon so that their book account is not affected by it? Um, they would need to notify Amazon if they wanted to open another account because they were uh, really entrenched in a certain, you know, type of industry or certain, you know, they're all books and right. they want to move into barbecue. So, hey, I want to open an account that sells yeah. specifically into for my private label or right. for or for barbecue products whatever right. um i would go ahead and apply for that and you know notify them and say this is what i'm attempting to do i'm you know known as a bookseller and i don't want to commingle my yeah. uh it wouldn't be commingling there's a specific thing that that means right. in amazon world but I, I don't want to join all my product together under one tent right. it's not like you want to buy huckleberry finn and you know, a pair of tongs for your barbecue. Like, let's say they want to just separate it out. Is is that could that negatively affect their other account? Like, is it not even worth it at that point to branch out and? Um, I wouldn't say that. I think okay. that that would be potentially a valuable opportunity to diversify. Okay. Yeah, I'm um, just curious because I know just, a lot of people they they want to diversify and they may not want to you know, maybe they're known as a certain specialty and may not want to just bring those same products. It doesn't make sense. And their current audience may think it's strange if, if they're seeing that. The, the hardest thing in the world to me is to do something you're not currently doing that you're not good at. Mm -hmm. Like all, everybody that, that I run into most of the time, the reason that they're successful is because they're doing what they do and they're really good at it. Um, they, are the best in the world at what they do. They know all the best strategies that give them advantage. And so uh, the, there's the one client I was telling you about is 27,000 SKUs deep and wants to be 100,000 SKUs. But now he's also saying, hey, help me get into private label. I'm not really sure if that makes the most sense in the world or not for him. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't, at, at the end of the day, he doesn't really necessarily want to be selling widgets. He's a really intelligent guy who would like to be building apps and selling apps or selling software, um, bringing it to the level of having it be a startup that's launched that solves a certain problem. I think that would almost make more sense for him than mm -hmm. to just jump private label at this point. Right. Uh, now he could, if he could do it all, that'd be fine, but he doesn't have... Uh, this team that can take all his ideas and develop them for him. He has me and I only have so much time and I think he should probably do what he's best at. And so since he has, he doesn't uh, have this experience with private label necessarily, maybe it would make sense for him to leverage his knowledge since he's been selling for 15 years on both eBay and Amazon, leverage his knowledge to create these unique apps that solve problems that nobody else is solving. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah. And Scott, so, 
I wanted to ask too, uh, was, again, I was reading some of the, the statements of customers and one person said that they thought you were so well versed in psychology. They thought you had a psychology degree because you were well versed in dealing with angry customers and with reviews. So what are some of the ways you get into that mindset and head of the angry customer and how should people respond? Um, I don't know if I can get into the mindset okay? because I'm not a person. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, like you respond in a way that... I know what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, uh, essentially, you want to diffuse the situation. You know, the first but they thing were you something to... you did really impress them. What did you do? to? Def- it seemed like you must have diffused a serious... A seriously angry customer. Well, it was you know it was interesting in that particular case. He had just found out about me, and he was wanting to learn more about what I was offering, and um, didn't really identify himself, and was wanting to see was I a real person. You know, he went to my website and got a hold of me, called me on the phone to see if is this is this a real company? You know, are they even going to answer the phone? And he was really just testing me. He was you know essentially. Uh, almost playing devil's advocate with with an argument that he was creating, you know, to to test me, I guess, mm. you know, and he was, he was, I think, being difficult on purpose, just to see how I would handle him, mm. essentially. And I was able to answer all of his questions and give him some confidence about the fact that this is real, and um, I was able to then explain various answers to difficult questions that he brought up about how to handle various situations and yeah. I think it was you know it became apparent to him that this wasn't just some sort of mm. you know throw up a shingle type of deal gotcha so on to the top 25 percent during the holiday season okay so what are some of the things that worked to do that uh, you know the the biggest thing I would say is having volume of uh, inventory. You know, you really need to be preparing for Q4 right now and even prior to now mm-hmm. in making sure that all the stock you've been selling fairly well throughout the year you have enough of and being, you know, not necessarily uh, inch deep and mile wide, but a mile wide and maybe deeper than an inch because the biggest thing is if you've got something that has velocity right now during the rest of the year, you're, you're going to really see that increase as the months go on, you know, October, November, December. And really you want to make sure that you don't sell out because you can sustain that volume of sales and increase your price over time as other people start to sell out. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of things like that. I mean, some of it is, almost uh, one of my customers is a former commodities trader. And, you know, when you get inside of the way that they think about consumers and the way they think about markets and the way they think about consumer behavior and all those sorts of things, you begin to, I mean, he's got this incredible knack for being able to time things and be able to pick Mm -hmm. uh, popular items and being able to um, basically source things that, are unique that have uh, limited availability where he's able to double and triple and quadruple and even far far greater the price on these things what else scott do you find if people are selling on amazon what else can help them boost sales that you find works for you you know i think uh you can certainly do some things with keywords that mm-hmm. help drive traffic to your products. I mean, I don't know that that's specific to uh, Q4 types of strategies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever strategies but, you find. It could be as little or as big. You know, obviously, you know, even with Q4 strategies, if someone stocks up, how do they, I mean, you don't want them to, to stock up and then they just have all this in inventory. How do they actually sell it, sell it out so it... Uh, you know, they're not stuck with the inventory. I mean, it's it's very challenging. I mean, every single one of those buying decisions is is unique in terms of mm-hmm. strategy and how somebody found something, how they differentiated themselves. Yeah, you, it's not the kind of thing where you really want to just throw something at the wall and see what sticks. Right, right. So, can it's, you talk about something 
so you're not giving away any competitive advantage, but something that maybe you're not selling anymore and like your thought process of why you originally bought it and and why and then how you stocked up on it. Is there an example okay. that you can uh, give? Yeah, hang on just a second. I'll be right back. Yeah. So I can't even remember how long ago it was that I – it was it was over a year ago that I bought this, but uh, – I, I stocked up on these. It's a Duck Dynasty. Uh, I'm sorry, Duck, Duck Commander ball cap. Okay. Uh, I bought these in uh, in uh, brown and green, like uh, OD green. And I probably purchased. I, I'm just guessing because I don't even know. Uh, maybe 250 of each, along with some Duck Commander uh, fleece blankets and uh, some Duck Commander keychains and some Duck Commander uh, cups. And they did really well for a while, and then they just completely flopped, fell off the face of the earth. Mm. And I ended up bringing back hundreds of dollars of inventory from Amazon that had been sitting there for too long. Mm -hmm. And I, I set the boat on that. I, uh, I think I got in too late. I got into a product that was a little bit speculative. Uh, I was thinking, okay, the sales rank is such and such when I bought it, and it's going to get better over time because the demand is going to increase and more mm -hmm. people are going to buy it. And mm -hmm. I kept my price too high for too long, thinking that I'd be able to maximize my margin on it, and it was a huge failure. I mean, complete mistake. Now, today, to get rid of these things, um, it would make a lot of sense to create bundles. You know, I could create various Duck Commander bundles that I think would probably do pretty well over the holidays, and I could get this stuff moved out of here. But I just don't have time. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I can I can have a, an idea like that where I could at least break even or get my money back or even make some money, and I just don't have time to mess with it. It's right. too much trouble. You have other things uh, that you're moved on to. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's tough. It's just I I used to collect items that I thought. Okay, I've got a uh, pair of brand new pair of aviation headsets. Um, I probably I can't remember how much I paid for them. I've had them for two years. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, I, I think about it all the time. It's, I paid ten or fifteen dollars for them, and they're going to sell immediately for one hundred and sixty bucks. Wow! And I just I don't have time to mess with it. It's awful. I bought a uh, I bought a mobility scooter for fifty dollars. And then bought a hundred dollars worth of batteries to replace the originals. And when I list that thing, it's going to go for eight hundred to a thousand dollars. I just I don't have time to mess with it. Hmm. I don't have time to change the batteries. I don't have time to get the pictures taken. It's it's horrible. Uh, I've, I've got a uh, yeah. Keep going with these. These are good. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a a Budweiser blimp um, pool table light that. I bought for $75, and there's another one listed right now for uh, 500 plus shipping. Wow. I, w I went out and bought the uh, light bulbs to replace the bulbs that are in it. The thing's intact. It's in pristine condition. All I have to do is clean it up, take some pictures, and get it listed. I don't have time. And it's, it's a bad situation in terms of it's very obvious to me that I can't focus on selling things the way that I want to when... I can't even get them listed. And obviously, they're never going to sell if I can't get them listed. And, you know, they have to have eyeballs on them. And right now is the time to do it because I should be taking advantage of this, what's going to be a busy, you know, holiday season. And I recognize that I had collected uh, over 10 pallets of books. And I, you know, collected them it's over time from various different resources. Excuse me. And, um, I, I knew I was not going to get to it. Right. I, I knew I was not going to have time to scan these things. So I weighed them and sold them basically by the pound to uh, somebody I found um, through a, a partner, uh, Peter Valley. And he uh, found somebody, he found several people, and this guy just happened to be, uh, I think, an hour and a half away. He drove down, picked him up, helped him load his pickup, and he uh, had come back and loaded again. Uh, so I ended up, I kept probably four pallets of books and um, probably not very smart of me. I just went and bought two more pallets of books and a pallet of records. And, and the bad thing about it is I've never sold a single book or a single record. But here I am sitting with 
you know, at least six pallets of books and a pallet of records. And it probably doesn't make sense for me. Like if I was my own client, I'd say, what the heck? <laughs> right. Right. And, and unfortunately, You'd I'm knock a some lot sense better. into that person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really need to sit down with people every once in a while and say, hey, what, what do the things look like from your perspective? And, you know, unfortunately, all my friends come into my warehouse and they're like, hey, this stuff's really cool. It's like Kid in a Candy Factory. But they're not giving me uh, the actionable, actionable advice that I'd be giving to them if they were a client to tell them you need to do this and this and this and this and this and this is, this is a huge mm-hmm. mistake and change this and that kind of thing. And uh, I mean, it's kind of an issue. It's like uh, I developed a, a stupid meme uh, that I probably shouldn't have spent time developing with a picture of uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, with a quote saying, uh, very few people know this, but the uh, inside and outside of my house needed uh, to be scraped and painted, right? And it's just like, I'm not trying to compare myself to da Vinci or something, but it's the whole story of the the cobbler's kids don't have any shoes. Right, right. So what about... So it's kind of embarrassing, you know? What's your best idea that people should steal that you're not going to use, Scott? Or you know this, is, this product has huge margins, you're not going to do anything with it. Someone listening, maybe like they're gonna go run with it. What would you tell them? I don't know if that I don't know if that exists or not. No. You know, well, you mentioned you... one. I mean, the one about um, a couple of the the those products that you mentioned. Well, before. no, I, mean, I, I don't mean that. I mean that uh, if if you're a client, I can give I can give you that. I can tell you which direction to go in. I can give you some specific product that makes sense for you to sell that I'm not currently mm-hmm. selling. Mm-hmm. I can do that for you all day long. As soon as I say, hey, everybody should sell uh, barbecue mats, you know, it's no longer a good idea, right? As well, as only mention, people who have listened this long in the interview get this. It's just going to happen, right? Uh, you'll, you'll, if you're tracking the number of people who, if you have some sort of service that tells you how many people actually yeah. watch to this point. I do, yeah. So uh, what's it going to be, like one one hundredth of 20%, 20%-ish. 20 percent you start the video i'd be shocked now if they're listening to it in the background they have speakers and they can hear it anywhere in their shop maybe uh, not that not that you're not doing a great job i'm just saying that's a lot of content for somebody to take yeah. in right well i Especially could also send an email saying i could send an email saying listen to minute you know 71 where that's scott is going to tell you the actual product that he's not going to do anything with that has uh a hundred dollar margin for you right uh you know i had a product like that and i just gave that to this one guy hmm. it's like no, i'm not going to do anything with it i don't know why on earth i didn't buy it i had two different vendors like that uh mm-hmm. actually i'm going to give him a third one these are things i already researched i already picked out exactly what i wanted to buy i already right. knew exactly how much i wanted to spend and i never did and i was like well i might as well give it to him yeah that should be a premium subscription on um indible like premium subscribers get your researched like top three products or something you only like allow certain premium members and then they get your researched uh products that'd be pretty slick really yeah i mean we've talked we've talked about building out something that's similar to that we've talked about you know because they don't want to do the work people don't want to do the work they just want you to tell them what is going to sell that's why i offer so many uh done for you services you know I can tell you how to basically do everything to remove your own feedback, mm-hmm. but most people don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And the clients I'm looking for are the ones where they want me to do that for them. Mm-hmm. Right? So what they, about I mean, eBay? I've got, I've, got one client, I've got one client with 4,000 negatives and neutrals. 4,000? Yeah, 4,000. Wow. And he, uh, he doesn't want to do that himself. You can't do that but, yourself. No, I, I, I probably can't. That takes too much time. I'm gonna have to hire some people. You need some negative feedback repair, you know, apprentices or something. Basically, yeah. I mean, I have I have people I could use for that, but this is more. I, I see more of a need to have more people like that who are highly trained and skilled that I can trust and my clients can trust to do that on an ongoing basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I obviously have to replicate me, and then you know, if they run into an issue, then I can help them with that. Right. And so, I mean, that's that's the thing that makes sense that this becomes more of a, a commodity instead of a service. Mm-hmm. 
So what about, Scott, we didn't talk much about eBay, and obviously we're talking about diversification on Amazon, and then off Amazon would be eBay. You're a power right. seller there. What should people be know about eBay and how to sell more there? You know, uh, there is one tool I can mention that I really like, mm -hmm. and uh, Joe Lister does a good job of taking everything that you have in your Amazon inventory and cross-listing it on eBay. Hmm. Now, I don't, know, I don't know specifically. I haven't had enough of... Uh, discussions to find out exactly what options there are for uh, Scubana to do that mm. um, because it may do the same thing and not charge you for it. So, I mean, all of a sudden that becomes pretty interesting as well. Mm. But if, if that's not something that Scubana does, then I would say, hey, Joe Lister is probably the way to go. If you're not to the level where you jump into something yeah. where you're willing to pay, you know, 1% of your profit to channel advisor or whatever. So how did you discover Scubana? I didn't say profit, but, you know, uh, gross sales or whatever. Yeah. Um, I met Chad at a uh, show, had an opportunity to talk to him and um, learn more about his product. And I like what he's developed in terms of having something that's fully integrated and end-to-end -end mm -hmm. because I think that's what a lot of customers are looking for. You know, if you're not going to be able to hire somebody to do all of your Amazon stuff for you, or you're, you're, you don't have a done-for-you type of service for you know any type of function that you need, then the very next best thing is to have everything fully integrated into one unified dashboard. And so I really like what he's built and the concept behind it. And it just makes a lot of sense in terms of streamlining your operation and uh, maximizing your efficiency. Yeah, so Scott, like you were saying, with that with that type of software, you said it integrate or it, it has everything in it. What did you find was missing in other things that that it actually had? Most of the tools you see only do one thing. You know, they're focused on their one area mm -hmm. where they have experience or a skill set, what have you. Either that, or maybe they pull in two or three and try to be a Swiss Army knife but only thing in, good in their toolkit's the spoon. You know, the knife's just okay. You sure wouldn't want to try to live the rest of your life on the knife and the Swiss Army knife and not have any other options of sharp tools, mm -hmm. right? It's just they they don't do the job. Yeah. They don't accomplish what they set out to do. Or if they do, they're super difficult to work with or they're super expensive. I mean, Chad's got a tool that, seems to do a lot of things really well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we talked about here, Scott. And one, thank you so much for your time. This has been hugely valuable. Anyone who hasn't listened to this point is missing out. One, two, tell people where they can find you. What websites should they check out? I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, they could go to feedbackrepair.com. I'm about to launch AMZ Coaching dot com i'm doing um account suspensions with nate McAllister, who runs the facebook group uh fba today hmm. and you can find us uh with account restored dot com uh indible indbl dot com is uh, for the product research i think there's some other ones but I yeah i should ch just have people check out feedbackrepair.com and then backslash shop you have, um, it's interesting, you list everything from free then down to the, you know, most premium service, but you do have a free uh, book beyond reputation management ebook that, you know, people rave about as well. And um, in my well opinion, write a letter, make a phone call. I mean, it is, it's good actionable stuff in there. Yeah. In my opinion, when I was looking through it, you know, the one feedback repair um, and everything else, I was like, yeah, he should raise the price on that. But if I ever need it, I don't want you to raise it, but but uh, I was like, yeah, one feedback repair, I'm like increase that for sure. Um, but the stuff is a steal from what you have on there, um, I think. Um, the interesting thing about the feedback repair is normally that's that's the first point of contact, and I get an opportunity to help people with all the other areas I of see. their account that they haven't been paying enough attention to. Yeah. And so in some ways, it's almost like a loss leader. Yeah. But yeah. also tested that price over the last year and a half to two years yeah. and it's just very strange i mean i've had the price up to 25.95 or something like that and it doesn't convert 
And really? And I've had it as, wow. you know, and I've been back and forth. You know, I mean, that's... I'm surprised. For some people, that's just too much to pay for some reason. Hmm. I think a lot of what people don't necessarily understand is it's a... Uh, there's no there's no loss to it, right? I don't charge for feedback that isn't removed. You, if right. you pay for feedback, you will either get that feedback removed or you you'll don't get a pay anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's a no loss situation. Yeah. One hundred percent guaranteed. Yeah. So, Scott, on that note, since this is the Scubani e-commerce mastery series, my question is. What are some of the best to end? What are some of the best actionable tips people should use to take action on right now to increase their e-commerce business? If we had to boil it down to just one or two, what should people start doing right now that'll have the greatest effect on their business? I hate to tell you no, an don't answer hate. this way, but maybe give me a negative that. one. No, no, no give you broad-based advice yeah. that everybody can apply and get benefit from. Yeah. Everything I do is completely custom. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I, I don't I can't tell you that I specialize in being a generalist just yeah. that to that degree, right? Fair it's enough. Like the, stuff that, the stuff that helps you lose weight is not the same thing that helps somebody else lose weight. Sure. How about fair enough, I like that answer, but I'm gonna push back on you for a second. And um, so tell me what about a client Give me a, I mean, you don't have to tell their specific business, but who came to you and you, one of your piece of advice really hit home for them and made a big difference. And they told you that. You could have given me that question in advance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I have a couple on here. Like you may have one of these. Um, I know Wade had something interesting. We talked about Wade. Um, uh, you know, Wade had a situation where Amazon removed his listing and he couldn't, right. couldn't I don't know if you gave him a specific, because you don't just give advice on, you know, removals or negative reviews. You're, you're giving some strategic marketing advice too for people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll help them in every area where they need help. And some yeah. people have, they have ex areas of expertise that are going to, it's going to far exceed mine, but I feel like I have enough breadth of experience that mm -hmm. there's going to be something that I can do to help almost anybody. Yeah. And so, I mean, one area would be, okay, I had a, a customer who had been working out of his garage, right? And he just didn't want to pay the overhead to, to get warehouse space, mm -hmm. but he was also working 80 hours a week. So we try to figure out, okay, what can we do to fix this problem? So, he and we tried to, you know, work it all backwards and, and figure out what is what is a meaningful solution here that doesn't involve a lot of risk. So I actually helped him find um, warehouse space. Hmm. I encouraged him to find warehouse space. Helped him find warehouse space. When he got warehouse space, he was able to increase the size of his operation. He was able to hire employees. He was able to. Uh, increase the uh, inbound and outbound shipments. He was able to uh, basically increase the entire size of his business and grow it and uh, have better quality of life because he didn't have to work as much. Mm -hmm. You know, he's able to work 50 hours a week, let's say, instead of 80. Right. And, and uh, that all came just because of the fact that he did it right. He was bursting at the seams. He was doing so... Uh, well with his business that he couldn't expand anymore where he was. So, and that's a great problem to have, but at that point, you've got to make some sort of decision to change things. And, and who wants to work 80 hours a week forever, you know? Right. I mean, for some people, they can do that and they're happy with it, but it's not necessarily sustainable. Right. Scott, so on your... What amount of time do you spend on your own products and what amount of time do you spend on... Because you have a lot of customers who demand your time, too. Right. I mean, I'm trying to keep as much time open for, for other people who need it as possible. It's, it's, and that's becoming a little bit of a juggling act, you know? It's a, it's a little bit of a challenge. And so I try to get as many people scheduled into spots as possible. Um, Is that also I, because you've streamlined over the years what you do as far as the selling goes? To some degree. I mean, I mentioned all the stuff that I haven't gotten listed, but then there are all the things that I've gotten listed right. that are now FBA, so I don't really have to touch it. 
right. you know, I place the order, I buy the pallet, uh, and then I process it, and I don't have to mess with it again. So I have a bad habit personally, not necessarily as much anymore, but uh, with procrastinating. So I had, oh, like eight pallets of stuff that I shipped off to Amazon in January. Mm, a lot of that stuff's still selling. So that meant that that's probably not a very good buying decision for me mm -hmm. uh, because I should have sold through it already and had to replenish. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my case, that was stuff I'd probably purchased six months to almost a year prior. So it wasn't necessarily a timely decision. I was just, I needed to, I needed my space back. Mm -hmm. You know, I got it at my warehouse and I mean, I had to go out and buy 18 sections of pallet rack or you wouldn't even be able to see me right now. All this stuff would be just right here. <laughs> so, um, it's just, I feel like I do a lot better job of helping other people solve their problems than necessarily applying those solutions to my own situation. <laughs> Sometimes when it's ask, easier. When you ask me for specific advice about what I do best that's, you know, works for me, yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best advice for everybody else. Right, right, for sure. So, it's interesting. I was talking to this guy who is a, a purple belt in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, you know, has some like third or fifth degree black belt in karate and all these disciplines, you know, Kali and um, uh, he, he's, he was a, like a USA uh, boxer, Golden Glove type boxer and mm -hmm. all these different pretty decent high level across the board in a lot of different disciplines. But he will still say, you take your own best advantage you know, the things that are best about you and use that to your advantage, and that's mm -hmm. different for different people. Mm -hmm. So he was a, a short guy um, who was, like, really, really fast. So, you know, and, and he could hit really, really hard. So he takes all that, and he has a specific style, and he adapts everything to that style to take maximum advantage for his style. Yeah. But different people with different body types and different right. techniques are have different advantages in different ways and it's all the same thing for online selling right. you know right. what are you best at? what do you what are you most talented at compared to other people where do you see opportunity and advantage that other people can't see right scott this has been very valuable i really appreciate your time and um i hope people listen to minute 71 or whatever is where you give away <laughs> all your secret uh That's things fun. that you haven't done anything with but um, I just want to be the first one to thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. I hope we'll get to talk again and have completely different topics. Yes, for sure. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care.